Dhawan, uh, excited to be talking to you, and you are the person, no, one should talk to when it comes to D two C because the, right now it's buzzing, and 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 everyone is talking about this space. It's the new buzzword in the startup entrepreneurship ecosystem. But you have been looking at consumer brands like way way before. At least I know, uh, if eleven uh, years back, but I think I was reading it's. since last 17 years you've been looking at the space you come from that world of consumer brands you've invested in some very phenomenal brands like pepperboard epigamia and of course now with kapiva vadham and mama earth tell me what has lit the fire in this space as of last one year what are some of the catalysts driving this space and what are the segments you are bullish about so you know uh, the the love for kanuma brands is there for the last 30 years shabda because i started my career with unilever and you know just fell in love with the space um, so what really prompted my journey from you know dabbling in it through helion and then deciding to you know do it uh, all on my own as a family office to the fund was really uh, some very uh, i would say uh, significant uh, trends that at least i saw coming together in the last 5 to 7 years and uh, the two main you know converging uh, almost uh, yin and yang that happened which led me to believe that this was something real and long term was one is this whole emergence of the millennial consumer Mm. so india has always been a young economy uh, but you know the fact that these are people who are you know uh, getting more exposed to global trends they wanted to consume more branded products they were aware of what was happening and so on but there were not too many choices so there was almost like a demand which was growing up in uh, in that segment of consumers and on the other side the uh, emergence and then the maturity of the digital infrastructure yeah yeah Mm-hmm. so you know, it is on one side uh, a real fact that in india building brands has been very very tough you know distribution working capital inventory management media choices media reach and you know you've seen both sides of the story so you know how complex it is uh, from even just media choices but then you know the emergence of uh, content players like yourself youtube facebook instagram they just gave platform to young entrepreneurs to actually reach that audience in a very efficient and targeted manner so that was one you know i would say building block mm. of course e-commerce made it possible to access consumers anywhere in the country in a very efficient you know very very uh, positive and you know connected way that was just not possible to do it through a physical distribution exercise so that was the you know i would say the start of this belief in my mind that something was happening which was quite seminal and which could change the way consumer brands were built and consumed in the country uh, this is circa you know mid 2010 so 2014 15 started investing in uh, you know some of these brands you mentioned some of the names uh, then the fund happened and honestly no, nobody uh, certainly me included predicted that it will reach this almost you know height of uh, excitement frenzy <laughs> and obviously uh, some of that has been driven significantly i would say by covid mm. so mm. almost like you know what has happened in the last one and a half years not not just changed the world for all the negative you know implications but also made e-commerce and digital consumption mainstream yeah so today you know consumers from all walks of life from all age groups from all demographics so it's no more the millennial is no more the urban elite that we are targeting we are targeting the entire gamut of consumers across the country because they have suddenly had no choice but to become comfortable and familiar with uh, with digital uh, consumption so again you know what i was saying was that covid just made it almost a no non option but to consume digitally and that then you know led to this whole proliferation of e-commerce proliferation of digital brand you know people were also looking for products which they could trust more which were you know something that you don't want to you know question what you are putting in your mouth or on your body and so on so everything just came in favor of uh, again let's call it digital first brands and that was one trigger which was again another you know i would say milestone which took the whole concept and the opportunity to the next level and now what's happened is if i can recap the 
the final you know uh, uh, steps that are really exciting us is that it is allowed now for these brands to leverage so many different choices so of course you know there is the amazon the flipkarts the you know another tata group then the reliance group but beyond that you know you are now talking about your own d2c websites because the infrastructure there is already evolving whether it's logistic whether it's warehousing whether it's marketing uh, agencies whether it is uh, all kinds of you know, choices in terms of technology players that have emerged that is opening up another forum and then you know as the market opens up and the covid kind of you know scare recedes the omni channel will start playing a bigger and bigger role so you know i can keep going on and on and on so uh, that's the you know longish answer to your first question uh, briefly uh, coming to your second point which you mentioned about the trends and what we are investing in see we believe that there is a opportunity across the entire 360 of the consumption wallet so at the almost the macro level whether it's something you eat whether it's something you uh, you know put on your body whether it's fashion whether it's home products everything is up for disruption because there is never been enough choice of brands available to the consumer across all of these spaces specifically you know i would say one mega theme that we are very excited about is what we are calling wellness mm. because wellness now you know pers- persuades or pervades every part of our thinking again whether it is uh, what we are eating we want to make sure it's natural let's you know less chemical less preservatives whether it's the you know the uh, personal care beauty products that we consume even you know the kind of clothes we are buying today even the home products we are buying there is this whole you know go back to roots kind of a, a mindset that has come in and that is really you know something that we are very excited about as a as a category driver across all segments of what we are doing and then of course you know the whole health and health tech space has emerged as another you know very important part of everyday uh, you know psyche of the consumer so we have started looking at that we have already done a couple of investments in the mental health yoga you know uh, disease management some of those areas so those are some of the mega trends we are uh, looking at one trend that we are very excited about and uh, you know personally i feel that is just waiting to be happened and we are glad it's happening now is targeting the modern millennial woman so mm. you are my target for many brands that we are actually putting out there in the market because we believe that you know this is a time which is very unique again for this particular consumer because more than being a wife a mother a daughter uh, or a sister she is herself who she is so whether it's you know gynoveda which does, deals with menstrual problem whether it is fable street which deals with you know uh, fashion the workwear and so on we are just finding so many opportunities to address this consumer you know we are targeting kids as a segment we have slurp farm we have bamart we have so many so you know it's almost like you know there are huge thematic platforms that are emerging and final summary is that the most important aspect as an investor and obviously as a you know uh, purveyor of the market trends for you is that these brands are getting built faster with lesser capital mm. that just makes that whole virtuous cycle even more exciting because you know today we have brands which have crossed 500 crores 1000 crores 1500 crores in 4 5 years time frame without consuming hundreds of millions of dollars of capital and that yeah. for a very strong investment he say then that's why you're seeing so much of excitement even from investors in this space you know while like you know on amazon or all these platforms we are like if we are looking for one brand then today we are getting hundreds right hundreds of choices ye dikhao ye dikhao aur dikhte ja raha hai sare platforms mein how you know and then and then that's why isn't it also becoming challenging for brands and and then for d2c brands to stand out you get the attention but if something works for example a vitamin c cream if it works then there are thousands competing right in that space how do you see this how do you see this as opportunity challenge how do you retain and uh, build that moat with your customers absolutely so i think the the short answer is that it is a challenge and there is going to be even more proliferation because you know uh, success will beget more uh, more uh, entrepreneurs and it will create and we welcome that because we think that you know the ecosystem is so nascent the brand stories are still just it's almost the start of the whole journey yeah so there are two or three things that i personally believe are you know very important for us to keep in mind one is that this is not a winner take all 
Mm. So, you know, we, we, we talk about, uh, you know, if there's an Amazon, then nobody else can exist in that market. Or if there's a Google, then nobody can exist. Brands don't work like that. So if we look at even our own experiences, you know, the shirt I'm wearing, the shirt you're wearing, we don't wear one brand of clothes. We don't wear, we don't eat one brand of food or we don't, you know, put on one brand of, you know, whatever personal care products we use. So therefore, there is space to have a lot of bags. As long as we don't forget one fundamental, which I must say I learned in my formative years with companies like Unilever, is that you are not selling a product, you're selling a brand. Mm. And that's a very key distinction. The fact that, you know, if Mama Earth goes and says, I am selling you a natural, safe product, mm. as important as whether it is vitamin C or onion oil or whatever it is. Mm. So obviously, you have to give me great products. There is no debate. So this protein product that you bought from Kapiva has to deliver on the product promise. But the fact that you bought it from Kapiva and not from somebody else has to do more with just the great product and the price. It has to do with uh, you know the brand and your, re- your relation to the brand. So what I have to do as a marketeer is actually continuously focus on what my value proposition is, what I need to offer to you so that you buy my product again and again. And in the brand space, you know, getting the first sale is not even that important as much as getting ongoing repeat customers and getting, you know, customer love. Because I can always buy your first sale. I can give you a discount, buy one, get one free. I can give it to you as a sample. But if you don't like me as a brand and a product, you will not buy me again. And that's a failure. It's it'll never going to work. So I think that's the thing. Let me give you a very interesting example from our portfolio, uh, which is the port. You know, they play in what arguably is a very commoditized space. So, you know, audio headsets, you know, earphones, headphones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when they came in, there were already a lot of brands which existed. It's not that, you know, there was nobody in the market and they saw an empty space. So there were these very low cost, you know, just imported and, you know, put it into a packet and sell kind of brands. And they were obviously the very branded players like Sennheiser and JBL and Sony, etc. So what both did from day one, they actually decided to put a brand of products in the market, which literally cut the market into into a half between these two. So if these, you know, local unbranded imports were at, say, 100 rupees, and if the Sony's and others were at 400, they came in at 200. So they were cheaper than the bigger brands with similar product offering, and they were significantly better in product quality and product offering than the lower brands at a reasonable premium to their pricing. So that was their proposition saying that, you know, we are giving you great product, great quality at a price which you can afford. And then they really spent a lot of effort in building what they call a boathead community, you know, millions of people who you know, identified with boat as a brand. So, you know, they chose, I would even call them controversial people like Hardik Pandya, for example, or, you know, they had KL Rahul and they had, you know, the younger generation, the slightly rebellious, the slightly, slightly, I would say, you know, off the beaten track as their celebrities who endorse their brands. So today, if you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you a very interesting example. They launched a, a trimmer uh, on Flipkart and they had, I think, 10,000 pieces which they were launching on, uh, on uh, Flipkart. It got sold out in 50 seconds. And that is not because there are no trimmers on Flipkart. They must be the 50th brand of trimmers, but because it was bought. So I think that's what is our, you know, mool mantra that you have to continuously focus on building the brand and the value proposition and backed by good product and good pricing. There is no substitute for that, but it is not a catalog sale. It is a brand sale. That's really, I would say, the key differentiator. What would your advice be to the D2C players who are building and we have 6,000 and I'm sure 6,000 new must be planning to launch? Sure. So, you know, again, I think there are two or three learnings which I can share. One is uh, launch fast, fail fast. Mm. So the, the, the success mantra for a lot of these companies is that, you know, they first of all do a very, you know, I would say growth hacking type of uh, inciting on what the consumer is looking for. And the simplest way to do it is just go to Amazon, look at your category of products and just start looking at the reviews and ratings. 
you will get a very quick sense you know again board as an interesting example they started their business 5 years ago with cables for apple charger and other chargers which they called unbreakable cables because they found the biggest negative on amazon reviews on any cable that was in the market was that it breaks very easily now you know people are not handling it well or whatever it's quite flimsy so they launched these cables which were kevlar coated and kevlar is you know the bulletproof material for defense and all that and they were able to just break through because they got that insight from amazon reviews so one is finding you know what kind of opportunities exist second is you know having a very efficient supply chain because you are not distributing to hundreds of thousands of stores you can afford to launch small quantities sorry there is a background noise uh, which uh, i am not able to fully shut out you can hear me right okay so second is yes. that you know you launch fast you fail fast so again you know a lot of companies have taken that uh, story you know you get a few thousand units made put it on amazon put it on your own website put it on a few other channels see the response if there is feedback if there is good reviews and ratings you then scale it up if not quickly withdraw it now these are some of the tricks of trade which this d2c and the digital first world is allowing you to do it you know in a in a conventional say a fmcg large corporate this will never be possible because you will spend 2 years in developing the product you will research it you will do all kinds of analytics and then when you launch it you are launching it in a very mass you know uh, distributed way so you don't have the luxury to say oh it's not working let me withdraw it so some of these things have started you know permeating uh, the d2c space across the board and i'm sure all the entrepreneurs have been smart enough to to learn from it and to uh, realize it but we found it very effective across so many of our uh, of our companies. Jill, what would you say to some of the entrepreneurs who do not get funding? Because sometimes when you fund, like for example, Mama Earth and all, you funded very, very early, right? So, both na, both ni a data points to funding. So, you choose some, you don't choose some, and especially in D two C space, how do you choose and how do you not? And when you don't choose. why don't you and then what would you like to say to those entrepreneurs <laughs> so you know uh, it's not an easy answer shoda to be honest you know i have deep respect for everybody who's taken this risk and become entrepreneur and you and i met 10 years ago when you were starting out and you know i have held that strong view all my life that we are king makers and not the kings so one is i think respect for the effort the resilience the risk taking just the sheer audacity of saying you know i want to give up something which i am doing a cushy job whatever and actually step out into the world of entrepreneurship without knowing whether it will work or not to me is such a you know humbling experience that i have deep respect so to some extent you know as a team that's the culture we are building that you know treat the entrepreneur as the king and not the investor as the king because we are always going to be support staff who will help the entrepreneur succeed and that is our success you know whether it's financial whether it is whatever you know uh, in the business that we are in second is that you know in the same tone uh, it is always the the entrepreneur and the founding team that you are backing especially at the yeah. stage that we are in and yeah. there is no substitute for that you know so even if you get it wrong you got the entrepreneur reading wrong if you get it right you got the entrepreneur right and i can tell you from my experience that there are enough and more examples where i mean let's take paper boat neeraj started with zinga and yeah. obviously that didn't work out so well but the fact that neeraj could conceptualize and launch a paper board and take it to the next level is really the power of a good entrepreneur and not just because he had a market intuition and i back the fact that energy drinks is the story that will happen so very often i have personally felt this that you know the a good guy will figure out a bad market but a, a bad guy even in a right market may not be that successful yeah. so that is that is the first mantra that you know we have learned and hopefully you know we are uh, institutionalizing it you know how do you analyze the founders you know and i can tell you you know personally uh, another you know personal favorite story of mine is i love meeting entrepreneurs in informal settings mm-hmm. so you know i almost i would say more than 50% of my entrepreneurs through my journey in the last 20 years i not only know them i know their families I, you know most most of their spouses and all of that stuff because to me you know it is a partnership which is something you have to 
you know walk together for the next so many years so you are you are living a real relationship and not just a you know contractual thing i'm giving you money and you report to me every you know month with mis and so on and so forth second thing that uh, i personally feel that you know we are looking for and that's one of the reasons where sometimes we are not able to go ahead with the company is the market space the opportunity and the potential to build a large business mm. so if we feel, feel that you know somebody is like like i said you know women today now table street let's take that example you know ayushi has launched a, a range of workwear for women and the minute we invested literally 3 months later covid happened there was no work people were working from home now what do you do because people are not buying those formal you know dresses that you will wear to work she launched launched a work from home range <laughs> launched a, you know more casual range so again you know it's the same manifestation of smart entrepreneurs figuring out how to you know leverage what is the opportunity or challenge which is uh, given to them so our current view is that we want to back great entrepreneurial teams in markets which we believe can be used to build large platforms you know now whether it's mama earth kind of platform where you have multiple brands under the same umbrella whether it is boat kind of platform which talks to you know the urban consumers which talks to the bharat or the small town consumers or whether it is companies like vadam which are talking to global consumers so we want to see the opportunity big we want to see the vision of the entrepreneur to be big enough to encompass this opportunity and obviously we we want to you know fall in love with the entrepreneur every time we meet them and if that criteria happens then you know then we will go ahead and do the deal kamal what do you think about the non branded space how do you see the growth how do you see the growth of brands in that segment you know unbranded is a little bit a morphous term i i if i if i can you say that you know uh, does unbranded mean commodity does unbranded mean uh, packaged but not very strongly branded does unbranded mean regional so you know there are so many nuances to what unbranded means so again you know the penetration of what you would call branded in the conventional you know the hindustan lever or the procter or the nestle definition is so small that that opportunity is going to explode mm. and we think that you know now there are numbers quoted that b2c alone will be 100 billion dollars in the next few years and e-commerce will be 300 billion dollars and all that but still you know you're talking of a trillion dollar economy so at yes. whatever cut you take it is still not going to you know come into a significant part of the overall consumption so therefore the let's call it unorganized instead of unbranded which okay mm. encompasses the larger definition i think that as a mainstay will always remain because you know there is a lot of you know unorganized uh, business that happens in the lo- local areas in the you know communities in the regions which is very much driven by local commerce so i don't think there is any possibility that we will suddenly see that india will become a 70% you know nationally branded uh, com- uh, companies which have taken over everything however i do feel that there are some opportunities even for some of these regional players to leverage the infrastructure of digital uh, commerce to mm. expand their footprint much more and you know that's where you now see these trasio type of models which are coming in and so on so these are not unbranded but these are less organized but they have found avenues they have found outlets and hats off to these entrepreneurs right i mean i think amazon claims i don't know how many hundreds of thousands of these resellers that they have on their uh, on their uh, system in fact I, i keep arguing with amit saying you know this word reseller is, is what scares me these they should be brand owners they should be you know people <laughs> who are selling brands on your platform why why should we call them resellers but it's it's fascinating to see how e-commerce platforms are not only enabling these smaller what you would call sellers and brand owners there are so many brand owners and i i just love meeting you know people who don't have the ambition to you know build 100 million dollar billion dollar companies but they are doing very well they are making money they are profitable they are first generation entrepreneurs they are coming yeah. from small towns and they could be in anything they could be in spices they could be in handicraft they could be in toys they could be in any 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 space and now we are seeing the same opportunity going global 
Mm. So again, you know, I, I think a lot of credit to Amazon because you know they are they are genuinely putting effort and resource and money to help some of these Indian companies, Indian brands to sell on global platforms. So I think there is there is opportunity across the board, and everybody everybody wins because it also propels more consumption. You have more choices. You know, the amount of products I order on platform like Amazon, Flipkart, etc. has gone up. My consumption has gone up because you know it's so easy. So yeah. So I don't know whether it's wasteful or not, but certainly you know we are becoming more prolific consumers because we have the ease of access to you know all of these things. Why haven't we as Indians seen a lot of big brands coming from our country? And you are the best person to answer this. You know we have brands from Indonesia. You name it. And 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 we have brands, but India me, हम इतने colorful consumer brands वाले country हैं, but we have never had big consumer brands from our country. Why do you see? I think again, it's a a partly it's an infrastructure issue, and hmm. partly it is that the consumption opportunity in India itself is so large that we have just seen people focusing on the local market people understanding the nuances of that consumer and being able to build a very large business so and you know because consumer brands by definition are very highly <coughs> valued even in the stock market and so on you know so if you look at some of the iconic examples of indian brand like marico as an example you know mm-hmm. they have in the last 25 years built a several tens of billions dollars of value in creating an indian brand and they have global presence they are in lot of countries internationally but india is such a big market for them that they are focused tata is another example so i think that was the i, I would say the first generation of brand builders over the last 20 25 years who said listen we will create brands for this large consuming market in india and it will be painful it will take time and that's why it took 20 years that's why you know we have the tabers and the and the maricos and uh, you know in more recent times you know the havels and the uh, and some of the other you know uh, very interesting new uh, companies but using the traditional means of building brands and that model becomes far more difficult to translate to global markets because it's a physical distribution led model but yeah, now, yeah but now with this whole digital uh, first model i think it's becoming <coughs> much much more amenable and much more easier to visualize how you can build global brands so while it's still early days and i wouldn't say there are mega brands which have come from india i think that days there you know whether you take even our portfolio whether it's vada whether it's ayurveda experience whether it's love farm we are seeing very high acceptance of our products in global markets i think the one example i can quote where i believe and i don't have the latest data but which has been a iconic brand from india which has built a global you know almost uh, uh, cult kind of following is royal enfield Mm. Uh, i believe they are, they have a significant part of their business coming from international markets and as a brand and not just as a cheaper motorcycle uh, you know selling in those markets so yes i think some of the auto companies have demonstrated that uh, they can be you know global brands out of india but in the fmcg and the cpg space i think uh, my fingers are crossed that in the next 5 years we will see some mega brands coming out of india which talk about indian sensibilities in fact today i was yeah buddy and we were discussing that you know there is so much of i mean again at the so- cost of sounding parochial so i'll talk about one of our companies i just met the founder so it's like fresh in my mind it's a company called dinoveda hmm and you know they solve genuine menstrual related problems through ayurveda hmm and they were sh- sharing with me video testimonials and they were telling me about stories of women with pcos who ha- who conceived when they were told by gynecologists that it's almost impossible that they will conceive hmm. and i was saying this is not an india problem yeah this is a global problem so why don't we think of how do we take this this really solid ayurveda based science which yeah. can help solve that problem to the global market so i think those are the kind of possibilities that i truly believe will uh, create these large global opportunities so i would say watch the space it's coming do you see the ecosystem the 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 ancillary ecosystem around it we saw e-commerce and now we're seeing saas which is and then 
you know, some of the big uh, growing SaaS companies have all these consumer brands and then digital brands as their customers. Do you think the rise of D2C will also see some adjacencies growing? One, I was thinking packaging, but I don't know packaging, but, but what are some of the spaces you think it will open up? No, so see, it's already happening, Shaka. And, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing, like I said earlier, you know, these, uh, we hear about unicorns every day and that's fantastic. But for every, you know, uh, unicorn that gets announced, I think one in two of them are actually the infrastructure for our brands to leverage on. Whether it's payment, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's logistics, whether it's delivery, whether it's warehousing. So already we are starting to see this really strong expansion of the infrastructure which our brands can leverage on mm. and these are mm. these are physical companies like i said you know companies like ship rocket like delivery who have made d2c possible because yeah. if today i want to set up a shop of my own on the internet i need to have all these capabilities to be able to you know i can't start writing my own code and creating my own websites and doing doing my own deliveries and you know all of that stuff but today it's a plug and play yeah so that is already starting to happen for sure i think the the beauty is that there is no end to it <laughs> yeah it's just becoming more and more prolific you know as it penetrates deeper into the into the uh, smaller interior parts of india it opens up new possibilities as it, as it you know starts becoming more and more plug and play you know it allows lot more entrepreneurs to come and just you know focus more on brand focus on great product everything else is available in the ecosystem so i think that has been the biggest benefit i would say of this you know last 5 years of uh, infrastructure that has got built and i think this these is company is getting funded and the kind of money that is going in is actually in a way creating the opportunity for our brands to leverage that uh, that infrastructure kaval while amazon uh, flipkart nike and i'm sure i i hope there will be more purple and all these platforms are there where all these d2c the cred is there now people are listing and these platforms are there magar agar mujhe banana hai 100 million dollar or 500 million dollar brand today these platforms take 35 sometimes i've heard even 45% of whatever you make what would you suggest to D, d2c players that should you eventually start looking at building your own distribution your own channel with the consumer and where do you see the future will it be more this side that side or hybrid so it will be hybrid uh, and i would add that you know don't ignore the offline mm, oh so yeah. that also is ripe for disruption see the traditional way of you know every morning going and distributing see now let's look at what we are calling quick commerce let's look mm-hmm. at people like grofers people like swiggy people like now dunzo who are opening up these you know little dark stores across <laughs> the cities so therefore i would say that first of all it has to be designed around what your brand really requires mm-hmm. and each brand will have its own you know uh, specifics around you know what kind of engagement you need with the consumer is it a high touch kind of conversation or is it simply that you know i have such a strong story to tell that i can put it on any platform and it sells by itself what we truly believe is that d2c is a very you know cornerstone of uh, any company strategy because not only does it help you engage the consumer directly but it also helps you in a lot of analytics around consumer preference you can do testing experimentation all kinds of you know it's like a laboratory for you mm. and obviously you know what you are not paying the retailer in the case of that you are paying to some of the media companies so actually commercially it's not that different in any of these aspects Mm, okay so, therefore you know whether you're paying 30 35% to the to the media company like a facebook youtube or yourself or you're paying to a, a e-commerce player or you're paying to an offline retailer so technically mm. the cost of you know let's call it distribution or marketing which has to be part of your <laughs> unit economics yeah so you have to design your business model assuming that that is the case and nothing new there right i mean like hundreds of years companies have built in the channel margin as part of their economics so that is the first part second is that i think that the power of a e-commerce market platform is still underutilized by a lot of the brands mm. because the reach that an amazon flipkart nike and all these players have is unprecedented 
so if i can build an engagement on my own website if i can create a strong brand story which consumers are relating to and that can be used to you know influencer instagram there are so many channels for that then not leveraging that brand on other channels to me is a loss of business so therefore i would not say build only d2c or build only e-commerce i think it's a balancing act by and large we are seeing 20 to 30% of the business in our portfolio coming from d2c Yeah. And 70, 60 to 70, 75% coming from e-commerce channels. And that's the rough maths that we are seeing across most of our businesses. Outside of Fireside Ventures, who in the industry, and you are, uh, you know, you are a very, very known, respected uh, VC, known, uh, you know, before Fireside Ventures, you know, I met you when you were in Helion, so you've been in the space. Who other than, who is the other VC? Other than in Fireside Venture, whomever you know, whom you really uh, respect and admire and you've admired over the years. So, you know, honestly, there are lots of them. Uh, I have worked closely with a few of them. So I'll name just a couple of names whom I personally have worked with and I admire. One is Bejul from Light. Mm. Again, you know, I find him very thoughtful. Uh, again, you know, very genuine. And we were on boards together. The other person is GV. I have again worked very closely with him. And I find that again, you know, he is also very similar in in the way he works with entrepreneurs and uh, the way he has, you know, built success but not let it go to his head. So these two I would call out, but I think there are so many, so many uh, people that I admire and how they have built and how they have conducted themselves as we see over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, Do you know, what is your out of consensus conviction when it comes to the way people build D2C brands? I think I've, I've answered parts of it in nuances. Uh, you know, so to me, first of all, there is no one show of it all. You know, you say D2C brand and it sounds all encompassing and everything. I think you have to design your strategy. So first of all, I would say, you know, again, this is not unconventional. I think this is conventional, but sometimes I find people forget that. You start with the consumer insight. You know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Why, why mm. is the solution unique? Then you think about the product. Then you think about the channel. Instead of saying, I want to launch my own website and then what can I put on it? And what's the consumer? Again, I'm being a little uh, frivolous here. But yeah, I, yeah, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. So I feel that, you know, the, the, the whole business of consumer brands, there is always going to be consumer at the center of it. Yeah. And, and I, I can tell you, you know, my... Fondest, uh, you know, or strangest memory is when I joined Intel in 1998, which is, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, I went for a conference and they kept talking about, you know, the CPU or the, you know, semiconductor of Intel is at the center of the universe. And I asked my boss, who was the head of global marketing at Intel, I said, isn't the customer at the center of the universe? We paused for a second. She said, never thought of it like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And from the industry, from the startup ecosystem, now it's like so, you know, thriving, buzzing. And it's like this time Prime Minister talked about it in his Independence Day speech. And it's right at the center of conversation when it comes to India. What's one thing that you would say, one jargon or one thing that we in the ecosystem, startup ecosystem needs to change? It could be a jargon or something about the ecosystem. I think I love the fact that we have this proliferation of unicorns. And I hate the fact that everybody is chasing this one metric of when do you become a unicorn? I think I think there is a world of opportunity to build very successful, very, I would say, sustaining, profitable, long-term businesses, long-term brands, without always saying that, you know, when will I become a unicorn? So to me, the unicorn is a is a necessary requirement in the current context of where India is, and you know the kind of uh, opportunity we need and the kind of global you know positivity we need. Therefore, you know more power to to them. But I want my companies to build successful hundred million dollar brands, which are sustaining over years and years to come. I, I find that you know this whole concept of saying either you are a unicorn or you are nothing, that is what bothers me. And uh, we have always questioned that in our head saying, you know, do you need to be a unicorn to be successful? And at least, you know, we have seen that so many companies are successful. And guess what? Some of them are also unicorns. So, you know, that is the bonus. 
if you had to look back till the uh, or you, you know you look back at the journey you've made till now what is what has been the fun and what is it that you you know you think ki nahi agle 10 saal tak yahi kar sakte what is it so <laughs> so there are two things one is i i just love the concept of entrepreneurship and anybody and everybody who's decided to pursue that so to me you know that's low people people have passion for you know uh, your people call, talk about you know education and people talk about impact and people i just feel that you know i have found my calling in just being surrounded by entrepreneurs so to me the my energy comes from that you know the more time i spend with entrepreneurs the more time and doesn't matter portfolio not portfolio see i mean we will invest in 15 20 50 100 companies but you know the the just the fact that thousands of people are taking that thing so my first philosophical you know uh, source of uh, excitement and enjoyment is just being around entrepreneurs second is of the job i just find the the width of exposure the variety the kind of you know businesses you see so first of all mentally it keeps you on your toes you know you you you're talking to a mama at one point and a boat later and a kapiva later and a vadam and you know so you just switching gear so much that it keeps you you know almost uh, you know literally you're switching away and then finding common threads finding common uh, points where you can you know bring value so one of the things that i always say is that uh, entrepreneur goes deep and an investor goes wide and if you can find that balance it is wonderful it's magic because you know we can help by saying okay trends we can talk about you know best practices we can talk about industry benchmarks but we can't talk about operating nitty gritty and you know the minute either side tries to overlap it's not going to work now if i go and tell entrepreneur saying no no do it this way and do it that way because operationally i'm telling you i'm right is going to collapse so that's the other you know beauty of this you know uh, this give and take the yin and yang between an investor and an entrepreneur so to me that's the real you know my biggest moment for the last 30 years and having you know seen pretty much everything was last year when my daughter said i want to turn entrepreneur and uh-huh. <laughs> starting a nutrition company in the us and you know, to me that was the culmination of anything i would have hoped for <laughs> that you know inspire somebody like my daughter to <laughs> thank you so much uh, kavil this was a very very uh, very very meaningful conversation and i'm sure everyone watching will agree with me that we learned a lot from you thank you thank you so much <laughs>